Hello and welcome back to another episode of Nick Tiffany's Movie Reviews coming at you online and in print format at nicktiffany.com, an audio format wherever you get your podcasts and even in video on YouTube. Today we are doing a wrap-up of the Seattle International Film Festival. We just finished the 50th festival in Seattle. It was just a just a terrific, terrific time catching. I've caught about 20 movies overall, conducted about five interviews, got to chat with so many different like-minded fans of film, so many cool filmmakers who just brought so much passion and care to the films that they brought to the festival. Always a great time. This is a little overdue as far as some of the capsule wraps up goes, but I did want to touch on the last films that I saw at the festival, talk about things to keep an eye out for this year. We're going to kind of do a little rapid fire. You know, there might be a few I spend a little bit more time on because they deserve that. But uh, without further ado, let's jump into it. First film I kind of wanted to talk about, and not get out of the way, but just as far as something I was a little more lukewarm on, it's a film called Janet Planet, and it is written and directed by Annie Baker, who's a Pulitzer Prize winning author or playwright for the uh, her work for Flick. Uh, she's done other plays. I really don't know too much about her, but you know, Pulitzer Prize winning anything certainly caught my eye. Uh, the film also starring a Juliet Nicholson uh, was something that I was, I think after watching August Osage County um, or sorry, Julianne Nicholson, uh, one of the first things I'd seen her in, I was certainly curious. It's kind of a coming of age story set out in the Midwest. Uh, you know, definitely one of those slice of lifestyle films watching this Bohemian mother raise her young daughter and the different people that they kind of, the mother brings into their lives over the course of almost a year, these different seasons you're watching her develop as a person. You're watching the daughter develop. And while there are fun moments, there are certainly bits that feel real in terms of how childhood and motherhood maybe go and how the two intertwine combat. Uh, I, I don't know. They thought it was fine. It didn't need to be almost two hours long. It was one that just was full of so much silence. And I obviously appreciated some of the artistry in how you portray this area of the country, how you portray what life is like when it's a little bit slower for some people as well. However, I just kind of, you know, by the hour mark, I was looking at my watch feeling like, wow, we still almost have one hour to go of this. And I'm curious if it's going to go anywhere. And it largely didn't. Uh, the the resolution for not even some of the love angles. I, I just, I'm not sure. Slice of Life films, you'll hear me say this all the time. They're not always my thing. They're definitely not something I try to go out of my way to see because I know that I would rather have a more engrossing story or character development. For a Pulitzer Prize winning author, I was also maybe stunned that there just really wasn't a ton of dialogue or story, and maybe that's her thing. Um, but I don't know. Janet Planet was one that I feel like I could have not seen or could have watched maybe on video. If you're looking for some serenity and peacefulness and quaintness as you watch this young girl grow, you know, my maybe there's something there for you. You know, it didn't just didn't really do much for me, unfortunately. I'm kind of moving along to one that kind of left me also a little bit questionable was I saw the TV glow from a 24. This is written and directed by Jane Schroenburn. And this is a film that I had one reaction to, but I've really taken the time to read a whole bunch of other reactions to it's a film about two teenagers bonding over their love of this kind of cheesy supernatural TV show when they were younger it is an allegory for so many different things from growing up in suburban life to our attachment to media and how much we can latch on to things and the way that we perceive them and how, you know, we look to them for safety in our own lives at times. Um, and so that angle of the film, I did appreciate and enjoy as a fan of movies and TV shows, as someone who lives in the world of film often as it's a great retreat. Um, something that I enjoy doing though, too, so much of it did hit home as far as how these, how this media has an effect on you, how it affects your growth, the way that you perceive the world, how you perceive yourself. And then there's this whole other layer underneath this film as I saw the TV glow 
is a I don't want to say a trans allegory, but is it deals a lot with gender dysphoria, with this idea of being somebody else under the surface, the type of media you're connecting with and what it says through its metaphors sometimes and how, you know, I think anybody when they watch a movie, sometimes it feels like, wow, that's really personal. How'd they know that about me? You're like, oh, maybe this is questioning me or it's prompting me to start questioning things in my own life or my reality or my family, whatever it might be. Um, and, and to that degree, I credit the director because I've had many, many trans and queer friends who have seen this film, uh, who felt seen, who uh, have spoken about identity, the dysphoria. Um, and for that reason, I would like to revisit the movie. It does have this kind of, I don't want to call it Power Rangers cheesy style costume, but there is this kind of blend of like goosebumps and Power Rangers at least for me, when I think of things that I used to watch when I was younger, that either freaked me out or was like, wow, this is so awesome. And then you watch it today and you're like, this is horrible. What did I like? I used to think this was the coolest thing in the world when I was young, or that this was the scariest monster. And, you know, to the film's credit, this is how we deal with our life and what's happening to us at a time really affects what we see. And when we're in a different place in life and you look back, Maybe you feel foolish, but maybe it's just a reflection of what you were experiencing in your life at that time. So I saw the TV Glow, a very interesting movie, one that larger audiences might not connect with as much. But if you know why, perhaps maybe you're able to view it through a different prism. I know I'm certainly looking forward to getting back and viewing it through that as well. Another film I enjoyed to, uh, to a larger degree uh, during the festival was a film called Eternal original title for Evict. Uh, it is directed and written by Ula Salim. This is a film, a, kind of a climate science fiction sort of film. There's an earthquake that causes this massive rift in the ocean, kind of advancing climate change. And while it is a sci-fi film, really it's almost more of a love story. And it follows Simon Sears kind of as our main protagonist. You follow him as a younger man, kind of, engaging in this whirlwind romance um, that for a while is all consuming, but you slowly see how his passion and his calling to not only changing the environment and fixing it, but studying this rift, studying this earthquake, uh, just how much it means to him, how much of a driving force it is in his life. And, you know, he eventually makes the choice to go and pursue a scientific career that will allow him to be in a better position to help make a difference but that comes at the loss of this woman. And all these decades later, when he is finally starting to get down, you know, he's a fully fledged scientific member qualified to go down now, explore this riff. It has kind of these weird supernatural effects that really almost start to blend realities for him and kind of give him an idea of what, his life could have looked like in all these different timelines. And he kind of comes back wondering, did I make a mistake as beautiful and as wonderful and impactful as everything I'm doing is right now? I could have had a life. I could have had a wife. I could have had a child. I could have had a home, all these fulfilling things because at the end of the day, he's kind of alone. And so it's, you know, it's a little over an hour and a half and maybe I expected it to be more sci-fi going in, but I really enjoyed the kind of internal quarrel he has going on between this work and everything he's worked so hard to do and this feeling of loss, a loss that he can't even explain because it's something that he didn't really have. But I just, I don't know. It was, it was very fascinating. I, you know, it's that kind of niche indie sci-fi that, uh, that does work for me. It doesn't do too much, but it doesn't necessarily have to, to tell a, a really great and enduring story. A film that is not so great. I don't even know if I can call this a film. It was one of the feature showings at the SIF uh, 50th anniversary. Friday night, Agro Drift, directed by Harmony Corinne of Spring Breakers. You know, that was probably that was my first A24 movie was Spring Breakers. So Harmony Corinne is intertwined with my film experience for better, for worse, for Big booties and guns and all the other stuff James Franco was spouting. Harmony Corinne, a master of neon and color and just, you know, 
Miami debauchery has teamed up with they're kind of like a video game sort of collective. They're a group called Edgelord, and they make all sorts of different kinds of media. Edgelord is a really appropriate name, um, if only because for an hour and 20 minutes, this film is just a constant edging. And I hope that's not too wild of a thing to say, but this film builds and builds and builds, and then nothing happens. And it builds and builds and builds, and nothing happens. And this is a, in their own words, a sensory experimental film utilizing thermal vision uh, and also overlaying AI and different like HR Geiger machine alien stuff over top of people. You know, it, it really started as a, you know, a video game style project just to show you what you could do with thermal and, Oh, we can have guns. We can do music videos. We can have all of this. And eventually I think they decided like, well, we've got enough footage to make a movie. People are like, oh, it's like Grand Theft Auto in a movie. It's like all these cool things rolled together. Travis Scott's in the movie, so they're going to have a dope soundtrack, I bet. The world's greatest assassin is all this dude says and how much he loves money. This has got to be great, right? No. I wish they had done anything mildly interesting. For the world's greatest assassin, you see this guy maybe kill like two people. And the <laughs> NPC-like characters in the movie are just laughably bad. I mean, video game dialogue can be really bad sometimes, but like this was like, I don't know how you try to make something this bad. The music is a highlight, if only because I kept waiting for Travis Scott to kind of rap over it because it's kind of this like dark, medieval, organy type stuff. Um, and, and some of the visuals do look good with the thermal vision, especially tracking heat and looking at how that can affect certain things in the shot. But by and large, it's just like, all right, well, here's five straight minutes of people flashing their guns and just kind of like swaying. And there's some girls shaking some butt over there in the hot tub. And it's like, are we going to do anything interesting with this? And the answer is no. So, I, you know, I feel like this is probably going to be like a straight to DVD, like not straight to DVD, but I mean, they'd be better off putting this on YouTube, I think, and getting more conversation about it that way. Just a, just an odd odd movie kind of bummed that we went and saw it as like a, a debut opening weekend deal but say lovey you can't win them all unfortunately one of the only comedies that i caught at south by not south by southwest i'm already thinking towards the next festival uh one of the only comedies that i caught at sif and one of the few standout ones i would say is the film babes directed by pamela adlin uh written by ilana glazer and starring her as well and michelle bateau this is a film about best friends and their journey, not only through pregnancy as they both are pregnant at different times, looking at kind of the support system you have around you, dealing with family life, a pregnancy, a job, balancing all those things. You know, Bateau's character is a second time mother. Glazer's character is going to be a first time mother with the father not really in the picture. Uh, so it's obviously going to be a lot of support she's leaning on from her friend who now has a second child and a family and is trying to get back to work. And Glazer's character, who usually we see her playing more of kind of the stoner comedic type. Um, you might know her from Broad City, a uh, fantastic show she helped create. Uh, but this film, I don't know, it's, it rides that touching line of comedy that you know, a lot of People are like, oh, it's, you know, the, the bridesmaids of baby making, it says right here on the poster. And I'm like, I don't, I hate those comparisons because going into the film, if you think bridesmaids, I'm sure you're thinking you're going to laugh your ass off and you definitely will laugh during babes, but it is far less concerned with being an outright comedy than it is also having some really great dramatic beats that feel real and that feel like something you can engage with as an audience member, whether you have kids or whether you're planning to have kids or whether you don't have kids at all. Uh, just what they talk about and discuss from friendship to doctor's visits to chosen family and all these different things, I thought was really, uh, really handled quite well. Hasan Minaj has a fun little kind of a pseudo bit role in the film, which is funny, but it was nice to see Glazer kind of take on a little bit more of a serious role I didn't know Michelle Buteau before this, but she is freaking hilarious. There's a lot of really, 
really funny physical comedy in the film. It's already out in theaters now, so you can check it out, uh, or you could probably find it on streaming not too long from now, I imagine. One of the only documentaries that I caught at the uh, the Seattle International Film Festival, and one that I actually was fortunate enough to do an interview with the director of the film, was Resonator, which played at the South, uh, South by Southwest Film Festival, won the Audience Award for Documentary Feature there, directed by Allison Tavel. This is a story about her own life. You know, she was born, and her birth father passed away, you know, weeks after her birth. But in her own words, she would tell you that she grew up with a father. Her mother remarried. She grew up with a family. Never felt like she didn't have that father figure or needed to discover more about him because she felt like she had a fulfilling life. And it wasn't until she's kind of on tour, helping in the world of music, that she visits her grandmother's house almost 25 years after her father's passing. And she finds what's called the resonator which was a type of synthesizer um, audio machine that her father was working on. And this kind of sparks an interest in this machine, knowing that it really never got sold, never hit the production before her dad had passed. The film sort of starts as her exploration, going to the people who might know, number one, how to program it, number two, how to play it, and see if there's some sort of value that people can still get out of it now. Um, and what starts is this kind of tech exploration really morphs into this exploration of who her father was um, and breaking down these ideas of family and friends kind of, you know, posing to you one image of maybe what your family member may be like, um, but really never getting into the, not the nitty gritty, but getting underneath the surface level and actually talking about the human being. Uh, and so really this becomes more about the man behind the machine and more about the man than the, wonderful praises everybody sings about him the nicest guy the funniest guy he was a genius he was all these things and that could be kind of daunting you know i think as a as a child to hear these things about this person who you know not only is your parent but i think it's really easy too to look at like where am i in my life at 25 this guy was making a synthesizer and building technology and doing all this stuff it's it's daunting sometimes uh, but what you also learn though too is there was a, a great sadness underneath the surface and there were issues with his own family, his own parents that were just bubbling under the surface. There were marital issues between, you know, Tavel's mom and birth father that she never knew about. And really the film morphs into not this grieving process, but really just this understanding of who this man was, the impact he left on people and almost kind of, bringing closure to certain friends and to, to family members by keeping his memory alive. It's a, a really emotional hour and a half of a documentary, but I, I thought it was just fascinating from an audio and tech standpoint with all the old uh, analog devices they're using. It's really cool to watch them play around with that kind of going out and reaching out to other musicians and having them play with the, uh, the resonator but then also what the film just kind of says about family. And I think the importance of being open and being able to have honest dialogues, because I think that's truly the best way to understand each other. And then I think to help honor each other as well. And we avoid some of those same pitfalls by having discussions, talking about our emotions and things like that. And so I completely get why it won that audience award at South by Southwest. Thought it was a fantastic documentary. And I definitely can't wait for people to check that out. You can listen to our interview uh, that I did with Allison Tavel here at nicktiffany.com or anywhere on uh, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and NT Movie Reviews. Definitely worth a listen. Moving right along, we saw the film Dee Dee at uh, the Seattle Film Festival. This was one that uh, was described to me as Bo Burnham's eighth grade, but for boys. And the film kind of takes place around 2008, directed by Sean Wang, directed and written by Wang, uh, kind of based on his own experience as a Taiwanese-American boy living in North Cal, uh, young skater boy. This is the early ages of YouTube, kind of looking before he goes into high school at this period of life where your friend groups are constantly changing, 
who you are is constantly changing, maybe dependent on who's around you or the activities you might be doing. You know, it's the time where your friends might ditch you because there's not enough room in the car and they got to make sure the girls get to the park as well. And you got to walk or you got to have your older sister come picks you up, come pick you up, which, you know, is the worst thing in the world because Dee Dee really hates his older sister and there's a lot of conflict there. Uh, so Isaac Wang plays Chris, who's kind of the main character here. He does such a terrific job of balancing so much of that young joy that you get out of being a hooligan, being a hoodlum with your friends, doing things that maybe you shouldn't be. But then also some of that sadness and some of that loneliness too of feeling like you maybe don't have people to reach out to or feeling like your friends maybe aren't really your friends and you're only with them because of what you can offer them. And, you know, there's trouble at home with his grandmother, with his mother and feeling like, oh, I'm smothered. There's no male presence in the house. Um, and so it's just a very open and honest look at childhood at this kind of particular point in time kind of this phase of growth where we're not always making the best decisions. And to Wang's credit, you know, his story has some awkward moments. It has moments that are uncomfortable, but that is what life is like, especially middle school. Uh, so Didi is just, uh, it's a blast. It's tons of fun. It's got some great emotional beats. Um, definitely one that you should look out for more, more on that feel good comedic side of things, but really, Really enjoyed this one when I saw it at the festival. Another one that I enjoyed uh, quite a good deal, but totally different from I feel like most of what I watch is Evil Does Not Exist, which is a Japanese film from Ryosuke Hamaguchi. It is a story about this small village in Japan. A group comes in proposing to create a glamping site. So, you know, like a, an updated camping site kind of out in this nature area and the town sort of responds to them kind of in an open, you know, town hall type deal. And they're, they're obviously opposing this because, Hey, putting this glamping site here, have you considered where the sewer is going to go? Have you considered how many people are going to be there? Have you considered the nature, the topography of where you're at? And really, it's just such, I don't know, it's just a strange movie in the sense that you would never peg it to be about a glamping site or like, oh, this is a movie that looks at how corporations just try to come in and skirt their way around regulations so they can make quick bucks so they can get different rebates or discounts on things at the expense of people and their well-being. Very meditative. You know, the first five minutes almost is a tracking shot slowly through this wooded area, through this place where I'm imagining this glamping site is going to be. You really are consumed by the nature around it, and you understand this kind of draw that these people have to their land there. It totally makes sense why they would want to defend it so badly. Um, and so Takumi, played by Hitoshi Omika, is kind of the main protagonist you follow. Hardworking, quiet, has a younger daughter out there, uh, but you really, through him especially, get an understanding of why this land is so sacred and why it's such an issue for this group to come in and feel like they can just wave a hand and, oh, you know, we'll, we'll cut a couple corners, but you guys will be mostly fine. If it affects your drinking water a little bit, it's nothing that's going to cause health concerns. And so it really, it combats all of that in a really calm and respectful way, but then really kind of in the third act, totally shifts gears, goes to some unexpected places. Very fascinating. Requires a little bit of patience, I would say. But I think what it talks about and, and how it discusses the way that these corporations or different people just try to come in and forget about the people who are actually there, I thought it, it was very timely. And I thought that how they kind of responded to it was a very mature and very enlightening way for audiences. And so I think that's something that people are definitely going to be drawn to. And I think it's one that's definitely going to spark some really great conversation as well. Getting to the last two films that I want to talk about while wrapping this up, probably two of my most favorite films that I saw at the film festival. We're going to talk right now about Bob Trevino likes it. This film won the South by Southwest audience award for feature film. It's directed and written by Tracy Lehman. 
based on the story of her real life where at a time when her real father was just awful to her and would disappear from her life, she sought out a stranger on Facebook with the same name looking for some kind of connection, looking for her father. Maybe it was him. Turns out it was a different man with the same name. But, you know, Tracy being this vulnerable person kind of opens up about her struggles with her own father. And you've got this man who similarly was not able to have a child or raise a child in the same way he would have hoped to. The two find this opportunity to kind of come together and form this chosen family bond that's just incredible. So in the film, uh, Barbie uh, Barbie Ferreira plays Lily Trevino, and John Leguizamo is going to be Bob Trevino, the the Facebook friend. Um, Barbie is just phenomenal. Uh, you know, if you've seen her in Euphoria, you already know she's a great actress. The emotional range that she reaches in this film is like devastating. I was crying, happy and sad tears, just like streaming down my eyes by the end of the movie. They're just so, so many beautiful moments in this film, especially discussing this idea of, you know, in an age where we know so many people through the internet, but maybe we've never met them in person. This idea that a complete stranger can come into your life and mean more to you and offer more to you by the way of comfort, safety, emotional support. Um, So much more so in that quick amount of time than people who have been in your life, your whole life, who are blood, who should be the ones taking care of you and looking out for you. Um, And so I just, you know, the film devastated me. It's beautiful. It is absolutely phenomenal. I had one of the best interviews and conversations with writer and director Tracy Lehman. You can check that out at nicktiffany.com, NT Movie Reviews, and all the podcasts and YouTube sites. It, you know, it is undoubtedly probably my favorite film of the year um, for so, so many reasons. Just fantastic. I'm going to be beating this drum all year. Um, vulnerability, honesty, and love. So much of that will change this world. And it doesn't always have to come from your real family. I know blood's thicker than water, but the family you choose, that family's forever. So Bob Trevino likes it. You know, I will be posting about this film the more, the more we see about it, but it just, just a beautiful, beautiful movie that for me has just left such a lasting impression. And the last film I want to talk about wrapping up our Seattle International Film Festival 50th anniversary coverage is a film called Sing Sing. Named after the infamous prison, Sing Sing is about a group of prisoners who are a part of the Rehabilitation for the Arts group, and it looks at a man who was wrongfully in prison, who has spent years fighting and advocating for his own release and for evidence, but has also spent his time helping so many different convicted felons you know, and this is, we're talking prisoners of any degree. It doesn't just mean the most violent offenders. We're talking people. It could be weapons charges. It could be someone who was in for selling drugs and has been in there for decades now. It's the look at how dehumanizing the prison experience can be. A look at how many of these people really did just make one or two awful mistakes when they were young, when they should have known better maybe, but maybe didn't grow up in the best circumstances, whatever the situation, there is a place for them now where they can put on shows, plays and performances for the prison, affording them an opportunity to get in touch with different characters and really get in touch with their own emotions by participating in all these activities kind of based around the arts. The film is directed by Greg Kudar. It stars Coleman Domingo as Divine G., this real life character who, you know, he's the go-to guy, the go-to performer, but his real goal is to bring in these men who need this help, who through these exercises become vulnerable, become emotional, become more human and understanding of their circumstances and how they want to better their lives. And the biggest thing about this movie that just shocked me afterwards was when they brought out the cast who were in the film, almost all of those actors were former prisoners who were a part of this program. 
and you would never know it from watching the movie because all the performances are just freaking unbelievable. The film is so emotionally affecting. I just, I was blown away. They gave one of the best Q and A's after the film that I've ever sat around for. Uh, the film really challenged how you look at prisoners, how you look at prisons. Are they really trying to rehabilitate people or when you put people into isolation and keep them away, are they just going to keep reaffirming the same things they already know about themselves or the same things that are happening out in the yard? Um, this is an incredibly powerful program that reinforces something that I have always felt, that the arts are essential. The arts are a way for people to experience empathy and humanity and to understand the world around us, and it makes us better for it. Uh, so Sing Sing, this is a rare and special movie that I believe another A24 pickup that, oh my God, I cannot wait for this film to come out, and I cannot wait for the conversations that start around this because they are essential. It is a just superb film. Um, and Coleman Domingo, man, that he is just such a gifted and talented performer that it just looks effortless. Uh, so that was really the best way to kind of close out the Seattle International Film Festival this year. Thank you so much for tuning in to these capsule reviews. Again, you can check out some of our written coverage on nicktiffany.com. You can also head over there for interviews that we conducted during this film festival. And as always, you can check out NT Movie Reviews on all social media networks, podcast platforms, and on YouTube because they're going to be up there as well. It was an absolute blast and privilege to cover this year's press. Thank you all so much for tuning in and listening. Be sure to check out all these films when they come out, especially if there's something that uh, was drawn, you're, you're drawn to your ear towards it. I mean, there's just so many great films coming out this year and it's just uh it's always an exciting time after a festival because now i get to wait now i get to wait and watch everybody catch up and see see why isn't it an amazing movie that's that's one of my own little guilty pleasures but thank you again as always for listening have a great day